good evening students today we will see paper 1 ancient part of history optional history paper 1 contains two parts paper 1 contains two parts this is section a in previous class we have seen how in paper 1 questions are divided into two parts section a part and section b part this is section a and this is section b but there is a transition period that is early medieval india because no age suddenly moves from ancient to medieval because particularly when the human interactions are more in every respect political economic social religious art and culture it takes some time to gradually move from the old tradition ancient traditions to the medieval traditions that's why the medieval part <coughs> early medieval part sometimes one or two questions uh, will come in section a also and uh, some questions may come in medieval part also that's why we cannot clear cut least clear cut say that early medieval will definitely come in section a or section b because it is a transition they can fit in anywhere now in this class we are going to see this part and in fact we are going to see up to this <coughs> ancient india and early medieval india section a sometimes from this part question may come in section a also section b also but today we will analyze up to early medieval india part i will show you the syllabus which upsc mentioned in the notification <clears throat> this is the notification given by upsc now we can see here the first one is about sources in yesterday's class i have shown you totally there are 24 units or 24 chapters in whatever name you can call 24 units in entire paper 1 out of these 24 units broadly we can categorize 12 units in section a and 12 units section b <coughs> here 12 means this part first one sources then second one prehistory and proto history indus valley civilization megalithic culture aryan period of mahajanapadas mauryan empire post mauryan early state and society in eastern india deccan and south india guptas vakatakas vardhanas regional states during gupta era themes in early indian cultural history suppose if you include two more chapters early medieval india 750 to 1200 cultural traditions in india 750 to 1200 so up to 12 to 14 chapters you can consider as section a i will explain you in a chronological way so that after listening to this you will have certain idea how the syllabus is segregated first let us see we take india map always in order to study history when you read history it is always very crucial to know about our geography also in the early chapters itself whatever book you take whether it is r s sharma or it is about romila tapar or upinder singh you take any book in the beginning chapters they talk about geography of india 
because this geographic land defined the history of india that is why map is also one of the crucial part in our history that's why the first question in section a is about the map pointing map markings in different parts of the indian subcontinent upsc provides a map markings 20 sites we have to recognize them and write 30 words for each site this shows the significance of geography in our history if we have our india map clearly then everything else becomes very clear in which part of indian subcontinent what has happened in ancient times so first let us take <coughs> this is present day india the modern india because before 1947 bangladesh was also part of india pakistan was also part of india later after 1947 this particular land was divided into west pakistan east pakistan after 1971 east pakistan became bangladesh if we want to talk about indian subcontinent that means we are talking about up to afghanistan area it was part of subcontinent including sri lanka also afghanistan pakistan modern india bangladesh and sri lanka all these we consider as indian subcontinent in our ancient time period this entire land was under ashoka time period if we take mauryan time period from afghanistan area till bangladesh and deep south it was under single centralized authority same is the case during mughal time period also that's why we have to consider this entire indian subcontinent as single geographical unit this is the first understanding whoever are going to start history optional because without having good command over map we cannot easily connect the dots to connect the dots and to analyze very systematically we should have very good idea understanding about our boundaries this is with respect to india when it comes to world history same is the case if we are strong in world map that will give us proper idea now this is the land now if we talk our history starts from the beginning of human evolution in human evolution in the initial stage our human beings were not fully developed in terms of brain capacity gradually the brain capacity increased people started thinking that's why different names were given historically to the human species like wise men thinking men homo sapiens so different uh, technical terms were there to study history we know about these people from the material which they left when they were living fossil remains were hardly available but the tools which they used for their hunting purpose to generate the food these rocks are rock made stone made tools they were available in different parts of indian subcontinent this is the evidence to show that this land hosted historic prehistoric uh, people also that's why the first chapter talks about first i will give you the uh, narration the beginning of history then i will come to how our syllabus is organized <coughs> pre history generally when it comes to pre historic age and historic age the main separating line between pre historic period and historic period is the invention of the script 
if we study our past from the written records that section we call it as historic period that means we have evidence of written records we can study we can understand what has happened in ancient times but certain part of our history it doesn't have any kind of written records we had to depend on archaeological evidences that is why before invention of the script before using of the script before language we consider it as prehistoric age when it comes to prehistoric age stone age <coughs> chalcolithic age broadly we consider these two periods are called prehistoric periods then historic age will come in our history this is a debatable issue whether to include this part in the historic age or in the prehistoric age this is vedic period suppose if you consider evidence of literature we know about these vedic people from literature vedic literature that means we are depending on vedic literature that means it is part of historic age but on the other hand whatever literature they did not produce at that point of time script was not there only orally they transmitted the knowledge vedic knowledge from one generation to the other generation that's why some historians consider it as prehistoric age but let us stick to this categorization historic age means from vedic period onwards because we are studying from literature and this part we don't have any reference in the literature that's why we consider it as prehistoric period now when it comes to vedic period if i take a timeline a time scale this time scale 1500 bc from 1500 bc to 1000 bc before common era so this is when it comes to the european categorization of the dates they have taken jesus christ as the reference point and before him before christ or before common era they consider 1000 years before jesus 1500 before jesus likewise in india also we have such references like 58 bc is considered as vikram era 78 ad considered as shaka era in our indian history our rulers used to count their timings from the shaka era for example if a ruler wants to give the evidence or if he wants to give the inscription he may say that he is ruling or he coronated if we assume coronation of a particular king he leave the evidence by saying that the king coronated 468 years after shaka era that means from 78 ad becomes 78 ad becomes 1 79 becomes 2 likewise 468 you have to count when it comes to jesus this one from jesus you will consider 1 2 3 likewise this we are following this before common era after common era reference period is jesus 1000 bc 1500 bc is considered as early vedic period if we take vedic period up to 600 before common era this entire age we call vedic period this entire age we call vedic period this vedic period 
is considered as the historic beginning of history. Before 1500 BCE, we can consider as prehistoric period. But one problem comes when it comes to India. India is a huge land. When it comes to huge land, now 1500 BCE, you may think this is the Stone Age. This is Chalcolithic Age. Stone Age means people used stone tools for their livelihood. Chalcolithic means people utilized metal also for their subsistence. Copper is the first metal used by human beings. That's why the meaning chalco means copper, lithic means stone. Along with the stone tools, they utilized metal also, copper metal. That's why this particular age we call Chalcolithic. When it comes to Indian geography, that is why I started by drawing the map itself. This is very large area. This entire area, always Stone Age did not start at in single go all the places. At the same time, Chalcolithic Age did not start in all the places at the same time. For example, if there are some people living in Stone Age, stone tools were using. When these people are living in Stone Age, some part of the continent, they were living in Chalcolithic Age. So now how will you consider Stone Age in India from what time to what time you will give and for Chalcolithic from what time to what time you will give. Similarly, first village settlements if we take in Stone Age also, Neolithic page, Neolithic age is the beginning of village setup. When some areas were living in villages, some areas still living in the caves, in Paleolithic, Mesolithic age. So that's why we cannot easily categorize that from this time period to this time period is Stone Age, and from there it started Chalcolithic age. That kind of segregation is not possible given the large territorial extent of India. Because of this, when these people were living in cities, and in some areas they were not at all living in villages also, hunting and gathering. In some places they were living in villages. So when some people were living in urban areas, cities, some people were still living in the village. Even today also you can consider, given the advancement, most of India lives in villages, whereas other sections of the population lives in urban areas. If you consider urban areas very advanced in nature, if you consider rural areas, even there are villages which doesn't have even basic facilities like road. In modern time, in 2023 itself, we have this kind of differences. Now you can imagine in ancient times also what kind of differences there would have been. Because of this nature, we cannot clear cut, clear -cut say that up to 1500, Stone Age ended, Chalcolithic Age ended, and 1500, Vedic Age started. No. You have to be careful in understanding that. But when it comes to Vedic period, Around this period, from this period up to this period, whatever life we know about the Aryans in Gangetic Valley, this belongs to this age, and we know from the Vedic texts. Vedic texts. Next, after 600, kingdoms emerged. Before 600 BCE, life was in early Vedic period, life was in rural areas. In later Vedic period, people started living in proto-urban areas, not fully urban areas, but proto-urban areas. After 600, kingdoms became strong, and this was the Mahajanapada. Great kingdoms emerged around 600 BCE. 
This is one historical development. That is why 600 BC onwards, historians consider it as the age of Mahajanapadas. For our understanding and uh, convenience purpose, we consider from 600 to onwards Mahajanapada. Around 321 BCE, one more major development happened in our history with the establishment of Mauryan dynasty, that is Mauryan Empire. Mauryan Empire. Now come back to Vedic age. In paper one, what type of questions will come from Vedic age? What type of questions from Mauryan period? What type of questions come from Mahajanapadas? What type of questions will come from prehistoric period? And in prehistoric period, this is very peculiar development to Indian subcontinent. There is one more development that is neither history nor prehistory nor historic, proper history. It is neither considered as prehistoric period nor we can consider it as proper history. That's why that section of period we call proto-history. That is Vedic civilization, uh, sorry, Indus Valley civilization. Indus Valley civilization, they were having the script. It is visible to us very clearly from the seals. But we are not able to read it what the exact meaning of it. This is very unique development in our history that even though script is there, we should consider technically it as part of historic age. But unfortunately, we are not able to decipher it. Then we cannot consider it unless we are, unless we read it, we cannot segregate that part as history. That's why proto-history, it is neither prehistory nor history, like history like culture, that is proto-history. What exactly questions will come and what are the subtopics? This is where syllabus is important. If simply UPSC says, Stony, Chalcolithic, Vedic, and Mahajanapadas, open-ended. We don't know what exactly, what dimensions we should read in these chapters. But UPSC very clearly defines what subsections you have to study in Vedic period, what subtopics you need to study in Mahajanapadas. What subtopics you have to study in Mauryan period? This is one of the advantages of history syllabus. History syllabus very clearly gives us complete direction what should be read and what we, we need not to worry about. I will give broad. Now, after Mauryans up to three, 321 BC to 185 BC, we consider Mauryan period. From there, Mauryan dynasty ended. New beginnings started with the new dynasties. This we consider as post-Mauryan. Mauryan dynasty. What we should read? Syllabus. We will enter there. In post-Mauryan, what should be read? Syllabus points are there. We will go into that. After post-Mauryan, suppose around 275 AD till 550 AD, this we consider as Gupta dynasty, Gupta era. After 550 AD, we call post-Gupta, up to 750 AD. Then from 750 to 1200, we consider it as early medieval period. Now what should be read in Burj Guptas, what should be read in post-Guptas? Syllabus. I will give you broad framework also, in what way we can think of this syllabus also. Now if you observe this, most of these developments were taking place in northern India. At the same time, there were some kind of developments that are happening in South India also, in Deccan, in eastern part of India. That's why UPSC clearly mentions we need to focus on the historic developments in Deccan, 
साउथ इंडिया ईस्टर्न इंडिया लाइक वाइज अगेन वॉट शुड बी रेड आई विल गिव यू द डायरेक्शन टू दैट ऑल्सो बट ब्रॉडली इफ यू ट्रैक फ्रॉम फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड बी सी वैदिक पीरियड महाजनपदा पीरियड मौर्यन पीरियड पोस्ट मौर्यन गुप्ता पोस्ट गुप्ता एर्ली मेडाइवल दिस इज पेपर वन नो वॉट आर द सब आइटम्स दिस इज अडवांटेज टू हिस्ट्री ऑप्शनल दैट वी आर नीड नॉट टू वरी अबाउट वॉट आर द हिडन टॉपिक्स देर इज नथिंग हिडन हियर वॉट एवर वी नीड टू स्टडी इट इज क्लियरली गिवेन नो ब्रॉडली इफ यू वॉन्ट टू स्टडी मौर्यन हिस्ट्री लेट एस टेक मौर्यन पीरियड और गुप्ता पीरियड यू कैन टेक एनी पीरियड वैदिक लेटर वैदिक महाजनपद मौर्यस पोस्ट मौर्यस गुप्तास हियर आई एम टेकिंग मौर्यन एंड गुप्ता पीरियड बिकॉज इट कवर्स मोर मोस्ट ऑफ द डायमेंशन दीज डायमेंशन आर ऑलमोस्ट देर इन एवरी पार्ट इन सम एजेस all the dimensions might not be there some dimensions but these two periods are very highly evolved periods that's why we get so many dimensions these dimensions will help us in understanding other sections also upsc clearly says mauryan period and gupta period is part of your syllabus and you need to read these are the items now in order to read it as a historian how mauryan period we will study if a historian wants to study about the mauryan period he wants to or she wants to study what happened between 321 bc to 185 bc and in fact on what basis you are saying that mauryan period started from 321 bc to 185 bc what happened in 321 and what happened in 185 why you are considering this period as mauryan period we have so many questions like that now these questions are understood are answered by these sources whatever you are studying in history there should be some kind of evidence without evidence if you say something that becomes imaginary not factual then it becomes not history it becomes a, like a legend or story that need not to be really happened history is something we have to know what exactly happened the events that happened that took place during mauryan period we know from these the sources which were written during that particular point of time when ashoka was there if there is any written record which belongs to ashoka we can study it very properly and we can understand very clearly that what happened during ashoka time period or some other time period maybe about mauryan period some authors some poets some writers they can write they were living in gupta period but they can write about mauryan time period for example today we are in 2023 in our freedom struggle 1857 revolt is one of the major events non cooperation movement civil disobedience movement quit india movement some of the defining movements now in 2023 we are in 2023 after 100 years of non cooperation movement we can write about non cooperation movement also by taking all the relevant materials which happened during 1920s we take all the material and the reference material some directly contemporary to non cooperation time period 1920s in 1940s and 1950s there might be some authors who has written about 1920s like now in 2023 someone wants to write about 1920s likewise now after 100 years in 2123 someone can take present day textbook as the reference to know something about 1920s after 200 years they can read about 200 years ago what happened same thing 
someone can write about Mauryan period in Gupta time period also. That becomes sources. Broadly, we have two types of sources. One is if someone writes about it, that is literary source. Something, always everything cannot be written, and even if those written records also might be perished. After a long time, it is not possible to sustain everything. But some archaeological monuments, like buildings, pillars, caves, temples, they can remain. That is why literary sources and archaeological sources are two major sources to study about any particular period. Here, in this case, Mauryan and Gupta time period. So our history syllabus contains about sources. And in fact, this is the first syllabus, first unit of our syllabus. What are the archaeological sources? What are the literary sources? About every period. Now I will show the syllabus. Now you can see here. First one, sources, is it visible? Archaeological sources. UPSC gives the syllabus so clearly that even within archaeological source also what we should read. It clearly mentions exploration, excavation, epigraphy, numismatics, monuments. Epigraphy means inscriptions, numismatic means coins, and monuments means buildings. Next, it says about literary sources. What should be the sub-items, indigenous, some observations. For example, if something happens today, Indian newspapers also write something, foreign newspapers also write something about India. That means Indian sources, foreign sources. Same thing about Mauryan period or Gupta period. Indian sources, foreign sources. Indigenous primary and secondary, poetry, scientific literature, and literature in regional languages, religious literature, foreign accounts, Greek, Chinese, Arab writers. Do you see? This is the, in fact, this is the first unit of our syllabus itself. Because this is very, very crucial. This makes the answer from general studies student. Suppose Mauryan history and Gupta history, both general study students as well as history optional students also read. But how will you differentiate from the general studies answer? In general studies, you need not to worry or you need not to quote much evidences also. If you write broadly also, still, you can get the average score. But to differentiate from that answer, to get high score in optional, when you are writing something, when you are writing answer about Mauryan period, you should quote the evidences on what basis you are saying about this particular event. This is about sources. Next, from these sources, what exactly we study about Mauryan period and Gupta time period means, suppose Chandragupta Maurya, he laid the foundation of Mauryan dynasty, then he took the help of Chanakya. They expanded the empire, expansion of the empire, battles. After that, what kind of administration they followed? Conquering is not enough. Consolidation is also equally crucial to maintain an empire. What type of administration? Administration should be very advanced, very proper. Otherwise, law and order cannot be maintained. This politico, administration. This is one dimension. This dimension in Mauryan dynasty also you will write about what was the political development and administration of Mauryan, what was political and administration part of Gupta time period, what was political administrative system during post-Mauryan, post-Gupta, early medieval, everywhere. This is one dimension UPSC mentions about. The same thing when it comes to the 
For now, I am keeping prehistory Indus Valley Civilization aside. Then let me go to Mauryan Empire. Now you see here, foundation of the Mauryan Empire. How this Mauryan Empire was founded? Chandragupta, Kautilya, Ardhashastra. They talk about expansion and also the consolidation administration. Then it talks about political administration. Then geographical extent. How big the empire was? How big the empire was? What was the boundary? Today, for example, if you want to study about India, we study about the boundaries. That's why the beginning of the class itself, we started drawing the map of India. Likewise, Mauryan dynasty has its own boundaries. Gupta Empire has its own boundaries. Shunga, different boundary. Indo-Greeks, different boundary. So these boundaries also we need to study. Political administration of the dynasty. Then what was the economic condition during that time period? How empire was sustaining, how people were getting the subsistence out of what was their food habits, how they are producing their food. Economy means what was their agriculture, what was their industry, what was their trading practices, what was their transportation mechanism, ports, roads, urbanization, if there was any urban areas, urbanization. All these parts, we study about economic dimension of Mauryan, economic of post-Mauryan, economic of Guptas, post-Guptas, likewise. Society. Society, family, how was there? Women condition, education system, caste system, Varna system, likewise, how the society was there, how it is evolving, how in Mauryan, how it was there, in Guptas, how was it there? untouchability, whatever society we are seeing today, in each and every period, new developments, consolidation of the past, social angles, everything happened in our history, we study about them, society. Then economic, technological, scientific advancement in Mauryan time period, scientific advancement in Gupta time period, then religion, how during Mauryan time period, what was the religion? Likewise, then art and culture. Art and architecture, art and culture. Any music, dance, painting, architecture, literature, all these things during Mauryan time period in Gupta, post Gupta, likewise. Suppose if I write these dimensions here, politico, admin, I will write for example, geography, political administration, society, economy, technology, religion, art and culture. Broadly, these are the various dimensions for each and every part, every unit, more or less going to be this thing. Next, Mauryan. If we start from Mahajanapadas, like Vedic, early Vedic, later Vedic, then, for example, I can start by saying, early Vedic period, Vedic period, Mahajanapadas, Mauryans, post Mauryan, Guptas, post Gupta, early medieval period. So I tried to organize entire syllabus into one table format. In early Vedic time period, what was their geographical extent, their administration, their society, their economy, technology, religion, art and in certain periods, religion might be very advanced in nature. In some areas, art and culture in some periods. So different periods, different developments might have taken place. 
सेम वैदिक पीरियड ऑल दिस महाजनपदास ऑल दिस डायमेंशंस मौर्यंस ऑल दिस पोस्ट मौर्यंस ऑल दिस गुप्ता सेम इनफैक्ट दिल्ली सुल्तानेट सेम थिंग इन मेडेवल आल्सो दिल्ली सुल्तानेट सेम थिंग मुगल्स सेम थिंग विजयनगर सेम थिंग लाइकवाइज दिस इज द सिलेबस इफ वी फिट एंटायर सिलेबस दोस ऑल 14 यूनिट्स इफ वी कंसीडर वी कैन कंसीडर अप टू 12 एंशिएंट 13 14 आर अर्ली मेडेवल 15th onwards medieval if we take up to 14 as section a in paper 1 section a then we can fit entire syllabus all the points like this it will come now i will show you the paper now we'll see ashoka foundation of mauryan empire from mauryan we will see then we will see the other parts foundation of mauryan empire chandragupta kautilya ardhashastra ashoka concept of dharma politico administration of ashoka edicts polity administration economy art architecture sculpture external content do you see same terminology you can consider it polity administration economy art architecture sculpture religion spread of religion literature then disintegration of the empire shungas and kanvas next dynasty once we go to post mauryan period contacts contacts with outside world growth of urban center do you see urbanization economy coinage development of religions mahayana social conditions art architecture culture literature science same terminology for this period post mauryan period from 200 bc to 300 ad what was these developments suppose if you take mahajanapadas around 600 bce how these dimensions were there that is the syllabus mauryans around 321 to 185 how these dimensions were there that is the syllabus of mauryan post mauryan from 200 to 300 ad we consider post mauryan how these conditions that was the syllabus guptas these dimensions how what was the syllabus now if we go guptas vakatakas vardanas polity and administration same thing economic condition economy coinage of the guptas coinage if we add into economy it will cover land grants part of economy decline of urban centers economic condition feudalism economic condition caste system society position of women society education and educational institutions society nalanda vikramshila vallabhi literature education centers literature art and architecture art and culture scientific literature art and architecture you see whether it is mauryan post mauryan guptas same dimensions early state society eastern india deccan south india simply we can categorize in different time period in different geographical location how these dimensions were there in our past that is the crux of our syllabus in entire paper 1 not only section a even section b medieval india part also same principle applies so in different geographic location in different time period how economy polity society these dimensions were there now when you are writing the answer if you give more geographic location if you bring more the evidences with these things then you will get better score regional states for example you see 13th 14th early medieval india 750 to 1200 polity major political developments in north india peninsula origin and rise of rajput polity cholas administration village economy society indian feudalism economic point of view agrarian economy urban settlement trade and commerce 
society the status of brahmana and new social order condition of women indian science and technology do you see any difference same thing but time period changes from 750 to 1200 how these conditions 14th from 750 to 1200 philosophy religion literature art and architecture in fact these 13 and 14 chapters just nothing but all these dimensions but they divided into two units up to technology economy society up to 13th unit religion art and culture as 14th unit time period is 17 750 to 1200 this is how you need to see so entire syllabus you can fit into a single table for each and every time period every geographic location how these dimensions were there how the economic system political system social system were there and why early vedic period and vedic period i have taken because we can read about these syllabus or we can read about these dimensions from the literary sources we have some literary sources it is not to suggest that there is no archaeological evidence but along with every archaeological evidence we have literary evidences so that we can compare what was literary sources are saying what archaeological evidence is giving evidence about this but before early vedic period it is little bit complicated in the sense as there is no literary evidence we had to depend on archaeological evidence that is why stone age chalcolithic age megalithic few important special one indus valley civilization in everything we are going to study about the same aspect but here there is no literary evidence we will study about their subsistence suppose polity economy we don't know exactly what political administration unless we have some literary evidence for example ivc script is there but we are not able to decipher it that's why this proto history this is pre history proto history in proto history also we want to study about the political administration but unless we can read script we cannot fully have the picture so whatever archaeological evidence we have only we have to infer it guess it probably this might be the political administration of those periods economic means this subsistence how they lived how stone age people lived how chalcolithic age people lived how megalithic age people lived initially how they practiced agriculture how they practiced industry were there any exchanges housing pattern society only we have to understand from there whatever remains archaeological remains like burial and if there is any house if grains are there food grains only we can understand okay probably this agricultural practice was there their religious ideas art and architecture whatever they left only that so same thing only little difference but every dimension we will not get full details even whatever dimensions are available we get very vague interpretation but again we have to study about this to understand what was the life of the people in those times in ancient time period now if i go to the second chapter first chapter sources this now we have done now you see prehistory prehistory geographical factors you have seen geography how important it is hunting and gathering paleolithic mesolithic beginning of agriculture neolithic and chalcolithic beginning of agriculture how paleolithic people were there how mesolithic people how they were getting the food hunting and gathering domestication agriculture started in neolithic it doesn't talk about all the aspects like society political administration because we don't know only whatever limited resources we have we have to interpret indus valley civilization how this because it is one of the biggest success of ancient indians around 
2500 2200 bc itself they lived in huge urban areas when many people in india were living with a primitive lifestyle these people were living in urban areas origin date for example today also in india some urban areas live in very luxurious life but there are certain pockets of india still people are living in the forest areas primitive tribes you can see the huge difference within the same 2023 same is the case here also that's why special attention to ivc how it originated what is the date what is the extent geographical extent characteristics decline survival significance art and architecture same dimensions whatever evidence was available we will study megalithic distribution of pastoral and farming cultures outside indus development of community life settlements development of agriculture crafts pottery iron industry agriculture industry during megalithic time period so in the initial phases of same thing in historic period also now aryans comes expansions of aryans in india vedic period religious philosophical literature transformation from rigvedic period to later vedic political social economic we have seen political social economic significance of the vedic age evolution of monarchy and varna system same aspect same thing if you have idea then mahajanapadas formation of the states republics monarchies polity rise of urban center urbanization trade routes economy economic growth economy introduction of coinage economy spread of jainism buddhism religion rise of magadha and nanda anandas uh, polity iranian and macedonian invasions and their impact external invasions political aspect mauryan empire we have seen already so simply if you remember this table this table your entire paper 1 paper 1 both section a also section b also both medieval early medieval me, early medieval medieval as well as ancient every part we can fit under this table only timeline change geography change but the dimensions are going to be the same so after your preparation you have to make short notes society in each and every period how society was there in few words only core points factual part so that before exam you can revise very quickly short notes otherwise you cannot open all the big books and you cannot read before exam you have to cover entire all four parts if tomorrow is exam morning will be paper one afternoon will be paper two paper one means ancient medieval you have to do and afternoon you have to do modern india and world history before one day you cannot it is not possible to take out all the books and read it it should be very short crisp while you are making that notes you just make along with these lines your entire now you see once you make this your paper one entire paper one is done and when it comes to paper two a different type of segregation will come but there also these dimensions more or less will help there also in addition to that some more we will get there because same dimensions with more details we get because more evidence is available modern india and world history so many literary evidences but ancient and medieval we have less references that's why we have these dimensions in a limited way so this is about paper 1 section a so section a paper 1 you try to understand the entire syllabus in this way you will be able to understand it you will feel easy same thing you can say only our syllabus is this in fact but as the upsc defined very very elaborately it appears very big one that's why you need not to afraid not to be afraid of this syllabus at all if we compress it this is how it comes try to follow this today class we will stop here in next section in next session we will start paper 1 section b we will see how that part of the syllabus is also there we will meet in the next class all right thank you thank you very much